I'm starting to look at my life life and go, I sit and I sit in a box every day. Like I sit in a box every day looking at a screen, you know, and, and it's like, I, I don't, I, I the, just the thought of that is gross. And it's like, why did I pick this? I know why I picked it. I'm, I'm now the guy telling young people what old people told me was don't do something for money, do something that you love. How many people go through life doing work they really don't like, but every day dreaming of, say, working in the aviation industry? They say it's too late. They think it would be too hard. They think it would go against conventional norms. If you never go after what you want, you'll never have it. This is Fly the Transition. Join us as we soar through the captivating stories of individuals embracing a thrilling journey into the aviation industry. From pilots spreading their wings to mechanics fine-tuning the engines and a myriad of industry professionals, each with a unique tale to tell. Get ready to dive into the diverse backgrounds, the pivotal moments that propelled their leap, and the sheer determination that transformed their aspirations into reality. We're not just about dreams. We're about making them take flight. Welcome to Fly the Transition, and now your host, Jim Schilling. Welcome, everyone, to a brand new era of the Fly the Transition podcast. I am your host, Jim Schilling. Can't begin to tell you how thrilled I am to have you here as we relaunch the podcast. So for those of you who might be new to the world of Fly the Transition, let me give you the lowdown. In the past two years of my journey in aviation podcasting, I've had the privilege of hearing countless tales from those who have dared to chase their dreams and transition into the aviation industry. The more stories I uncovered, the more captivated I became with not just the journey itself, but the unique paths people were on before they entered aviation. This little passion project of mine sprang to life in the midst of a perfect storm, really. It was a time when the aviation industry faced a dire pilot shortage, a challenging economic landscape in the nation, and a shift in societal priorities. People started choosing career paths that brought them happiness and fulfillment, not just a paycheck. This shift wasn't just limited to traditional pilot roles either. It spread to various other careers within aviation, and that's what we're here to explore. The Fly the Transition podcast was born about a year ago. I was able to publish seven episodes talking to people about their journey from one career path into something related to aviation. Unfortunately, that had to go on the back burner for some other priorities in life. But now, we're back and better than ever. I've been working like crazy over the past few months to bring you this relaunch. I got a fresh new logo, revamping the intro, and I've managed to get a spectacular lineup of guests that are bound to keep you on the edge of your seats. As we dive into these episodes in the near future, we'll be talking to people who have made the leap into aviation from careers like IT, public safety, teaching, engineering, and so many more. The journey into a career in aviation isn't always a straightforward one, and that's what makes these stories so incredible. So even with all the work that's gone into this podcast, I've had an absolute blast talking with our guests, listening to their remarkable stories, and piecing them together to bring them to life in these episodes. So with all that, here we are, ready to kick off a new era of the Fly the Transition podcast. But before we get into our interview, a quick word from our sponsors that make the Fly the Transition podcast possible. Attention Aviators. If you're passionate about flying, you need to check out Pilot Quarters. They are a pilot-owned family business based right in the Midwest in Michigan. They are on a mission to create your next favorite flying shirt. From comfy camp shirts to stylish polo shirts, sundresses, and tees, Pilot Quarters crafts unique aviation apparel. Choose from full-color chart designs, subtle overlays, or even wild tropical pattern blends with your favorite charts. Elevate your style and aviation passion. Visit pilotquarters.com today and soar in style. Aviation friends, let me share with you an absolute game changer in eyewear. I am personally hooked on Flying Eyes Optics. Their stylish designs pair seamlessly with your headset for superior comfort. I used to fly with those cheap gas station sunglasses, but since switching to Flying Eyes, I can't go back. They're sleek, durable, and way more comfortable. Trust me, your eyes deserve the upgrade. Check out our affiliate link in the show notes, and make sure you use code FLYINGMIDWEST10 for an unbeatable 10% off your purchase at Flying Eyes. Fly with comfort, fly with style. Visit Flying Eyes Optics today. Let's talk about some of the best active noise reduction headsets on the market. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just taking flight lessons, 
Lightspeed Aviation headsets are engineered with you in mind every step of the way. They've created the quietest and most durable A&R headsets on the market. Their high quality and innovative technology ensures you stay comfortable, connected, and safe in the cockpit. I've personally flown with Lightspeed for over a decade and I wouldn't dream of flying with any other headset. Elevate your flying experience with Lightspeed. Check out our affiliate link in the show notes so that you can support the podcast with your next purchase. All right, aviators, gear up for the skies with the latest and greatest in merchandise. That's right, in addition to Fly Midwest Podcast merchandise, we also have Fly the Transition merch, including the relaunched Fly the Transition logo. And to celebrate the relaunch of the podcast, if you use promo code NEW24, you'll get 10% off any purchase on flyingmidwest.com. So visit flyingmidwest.com forward slash merch today. You're listening to Fly the Transition. If you've ever thought about changing careers and getting into the aviation industry, welcome to your new home. Now, back to your host, Jim Schilling. For our very first episode, I've got a real treat for you. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome the one and only Brian Turner from the YouTube channel Just Plain Silly. You may also know him from his website, worldsgreatestpilot.com. Now, he insists that because he owns the website, clearly it has to be true. I'm really excited to have Brian because he's been an incredible supporter of my podcasting adventures, both with this and with the Flying Midwest podcast. So it's a real honor to have him as the first guest in the relaunch of Fly the Transition. So before we get to Brian, let's talk about his journey a little bit. As a career for Brian, he's been knee deep in the world of IT, but now he's starting to steer his career into the direction of an airline. His progressions through the ratings has been gradual over time, but now he's close to being able to take those skills and translate them into a career in aviation. His journey has certainly been a transition filled with challenges and excitement, and there's some inspiration along the way as well, and I can't wait for you all to hear about it. So without further ado, let's jump into the interview with Brian Turner from Just Plain Silly. Okay, so I want to welcome Brian Turner to the Fly the Transition podcast. Now, Brian, you are a longtime friend of the Fly Midwest podcast. Thank you for that, by the way. And everyone else should probably know and love you from your YouTube presence on Just Plain Silly. (laughs) Today. (laughs) I mean, some some people are a big fan. (laughs) Some are. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So we talked a little bit before we got started here formally, but... um, we're going to do something a little bit different than the content that we have on the Flying Midwest podcast. Um, we want to talk a bit about your journey um, from where you're at right now in a career in IT to a, a hopefully a dream of a full-blown career in aviation. That's correct. Hopefully. Hopefully. So, and again, a little bit different from some of the other guests too, is typically we've talked to someone who's the, they've made it through the process, but I thought it would be really cool to talk to someone who's still like in the midst of their journey and kind of get their perspective as they're going through it and maybe offer some thoughts and guidance, if you will, to those that are looking to make a leap as well. So, yeah. And if if you could connect connect me to the people who've made the journey, that would be great because I could use some help. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. So how about we get started by uh, just asking how you first got your exposure to aviation? I think it's probably the kind of a common cliche story. I'm always the, it was in my blood guy. Um, always airplanes when I was a kid, radio controlled airplanes, kites, anything that would fly, just always fascinated by that stuff. And then, um, somewhere in the eighties, my dad, uh, got his pilot's license. And so he had a little Cherokee that he shared with a friend and he'd take me up, but, um, just any, any chance I could have to get airborne was just always, uh, very eager to do so. And, and just fascinated by it. It's just one of those things. It's just, I'm like a magnet to aviation. It just feels like that's what I need to be doing. So you didn't first go into aviation as a career. No, 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 no. Well, wouldn't that have been a, <laughs> a good choice? So uh, when I was young, I was not academic. I didn't do very well in school. I didn't have aspirations of doing anything. Um, and I, I just, I worked at a restaurant and I was like, I'm just going to be a restaurant guy. I'll be a cook because that's what I, but I'm, I'm, I'm someone who doesn't deviate much from, from what's around me, which is kind of, in hindsight, it's, it's sad, but I was like, okay, I work at the restaurant. I'll just be at the restaurant. And my parents, and this was a time when everybody had to go to college. Everybody had to go yeah. to college. You couldn't, you know, my generation could not go. Um, things have changed a little bit and that's fine. Um, but so my my parents did pay for my college, which at the time was probably less than a, a modern car. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was, it was fairly cheap back then to go to state school. And so, but they sent me to college 
And I just kind of hemmed and hawed and, you know, I did the party thing and, and didn't do a whole lot. And, you know, one day my advisor's like, you know, you got to pick a major. And I was like, well, dad's a, a programmer and mom's a psychologist. And I knew dad made more money than mom. So I said, I'll, I'll, major, I'll major in programming and then I'll minor in psychology because uh, I like my parents. And they seem they seem to like what they do. Uh, not even thinking about how hard like computer science was going. It was probably one of the hardest things I'd, I'd ever done, you know, as far as just picking a career. Um, and I got into programming and, and quickly found out that I, I, I liked programming the way it used to be. Uh, I really enjoy solving problems. I really enjoy logic. And then so my grades started to get good. I started to really like have a bit of a passion for like, you know, what I was doing and I really enjoyed it. And so I said, okay, I'll keep this major. And, you know, I got, I got my degree in computer science. And even today, I'm, that's, a, that's a pride point because I went to school with this, this kind of, I don't know, deadbeat loser friends I had in high school. We moved, had our apartment together and they just, they majored in whatever was easy, you know, communication, just, just get a degree, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I was like, I was pretty proud of myself for like, cause I, I was not that different from them, but I was like, I need, I, I want to do something hard cause I don't do anything hard in my life. And so I did, I picked something hard and I did really well at it. So I was a programmer for a long time and I enjoyed programming. Uh, the programming started to change when Microsoft started to bring in these, I, I don't want to go down programming nonsense rabbit holes, but th they started changing the framework of how programming was done. And I, I fell out of love with it. And I, I came to this realization probably 10 to 12 years into my career that just because you're good at something doesn't mean you love it. And so I said, well, at the time IT was still paying pretty well. I said, I want to stay in IT because because the money's decent. And so um, I'll see if I can kind of start uh, try out for a team lead position. They came up and kind of climbed the ladder a little bit. And I, I got to where I was, I had direct reports. Um, and then that was about the time my wife and I started ha having a family and I, kind of in the mix of going, okay, I've got, I'm, I'm up all the time. I've got babies at home. I've got, my life is full. Um, if I want to continue to do any hands-on development, I can no longer stay up reading, studying, learning at night. I don't have it. And I was like managing people. I was like, people are, are all kind of the same. They don't change that much. And so I was like, I'll, I just go full in management. And so, you know, jump to modern times. The last 10 years I've been, you know, I'm IT director or whatever. Like I, I just report to the owner of the company. All, all of the IT flows, you know, up to me, but I don't, I just... It's a, it's a chess game, right? It's like, here's the problem. Here's my strong guys who are going to solve this problem. Here's my B players who are going to solve this problem. And these people are going to mentor those people. It's And, and, and I enjoy it. Um, but I, I'm, at the, I'm at the end of it. I'm 20. This will be 24 years I've been in IT. And I've, I've gotten real tired of sort of being a bird in a cage. Like, and especially having, you know, 10 years ago, learned to fly. I, yeah. I'm starting to look at my life, life and go, I sit and I sit in a box every day. Like I sit in a box every day looking at a screen, you know, and, and it's like the, just the thought of that is gross. And it's like, why did I pick this? I know why I picked it. So I am, I am trying as hard as I can right now to be at the end of an IT career. And <laughs> within your role, not just as a programmer, but within the management roles too, um, what were some of the pros and cons of your career as you moved your way up the ladder? I hate to sound shallow. The pros were the money. That's why that's really, I got into IT because I was, I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And it paid well. And it paid well. Um, it certainly didn't scale up with inflation and all that kind of stuff. So it, it pays okay now. But um, so the, the the money was good. I have a far better lifestyle than I probably deserve. I guess like I'm not a wealthy person, but I'm not struggling. Sure. So and a lot of people are. And a lot of people are. Um, so I'm I'm really fortunate in the respect that I was able to do what I consider to be complicated things. I tell people all the time I'm not smart, but somehow this this I was okay at. So the, the, the pros were that, the, I mean, there's, 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 there's not a ton of, I mean, if, how do I sell you on a job where you, you're going to sit in a, a cubicle all day and then you're going to go home at night and the phone's going to ring because something's broken and then you got to work overnight and fix it. And then you got to explain it to some multimillionaire who really doesn't care to understand it, doesn't want to understand it, but he's mad because it's like, you're always on the hook. And yeah. you're always on the hook to people. I've, I've never reported to technical people. I've always reported to guys who built a business and they don't get it and that they roll their eyes. And so um, the, I guess, I guess a pro for me is I consider myself to be a pretty good communicator with respect to dumbing things down to people who need it dumbed down like CEOs and um, understanding technical for people like developers. And I've, I, I, 
if you just told me this 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have believed it, but developers don't do a very good job of communicating to CEOs and vice versa. Sure. Um, I do think, I'm not trying to sound like, I don't think I'm arrogant, but I, I think I'm very good at tailoring my communication to my audience. And so I know how to talk to my CEO and my, my developers don't seem to, and I know how to talk to them. And so I think, I, which is weird, I think that's the most value I provide right now in my position is that I can bridge this gap. And it's sad to me that everyone can't do it because I feel like like that's not work. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm naturally comfortable in, in positions where I've got technical people on my team and I report to non-technical people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm comfortable, which I guess is a pro. Um, the, the cons are the time. You know, the fact that you, you know, I go out of town, I bring my laptop with me, you know, yeah. uh, the job's always there. And today I'm trying to get something done that, that needs to be done. And I've got vendors waiting on me saying, sign the contract, sign the contract. And I've got a COO that's like, well, I don't understand it. And I was like, we don't have time for you to understand that. I'm really sorry. I need to sign it. And he's like, well, let's talk Monday. And I'm like, that's four more days. We've just lost it. So, yeah. and, I, and I can't explain it to him so he'll understand it. And I know at the end of the day, he's going to end up signing it. I know he's going to, like, that's how the story ends. But he won't just do it. And he like he he needs me to try to explain it to him and he won't understand it. He'll be like, Well, if this is what you think is right, let's do it. And I'm gonna go, Why couldn't we have just done this on Friday? So beating my head against the wall a lot in this position with respect to those type type of things where I don't have any real control. I think there's a I think there's a lot of cons and I don't think I was aware of them until I've gotten older and I start realizing how much time I've got left and what I want to do with it. And I'm like, yeah. Man, this is a really bad choice, Brian. So I, I tell my kids, I already said this, but I'm like, try not to try not to be in an office. Try, you know, I, I want my kids to go. You know, my 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 do- daughter wants to be a doctor. My son wants to be, you know, I, he wants to be a teacher. I like be a teacher, be a nurse, be something where you're talking to people, where you're on your feet, where you'll always have a job no matter where you go. Um, yep. and don't don't just sit behind a machine. It's fun and it, it satisfies your you know instant gratification or whatever. But it's if you think about it, it's really depressing. Sure. Again, this is an old man lamenting. <laughs> I could I could have been flying jets, <laughs> but I'm going. Well, at, so. at some point, though, those things drive you towards actually, you know, following your dreams and going towards that professional flying gig. You know, hundred percent. Yeah. There's nothing else I want to do, and this has taught me that. Like you, you've had a career that you were good at and that paid well, but you, you were you were never unhappy, but you were happy, and it's like there's this other thing in your life that makes you happy every single time you yell clear prop, and it's like why can't I just do that? And it's like you can. Go do it. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, like I guess I've, I've set myself down and lectured myself and, you know, we're come hell or high water, we're going to get it done. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to figure out if it's hell or high water. <laughs> in hindsight, there, the, I know why I didn't go into aviation multiple times in my career. And in, in hindsight, they were all stupid reasons. Yeah, at any point in time when I thought about it, I should have just done it and I'd, I'd be way happier now. But I'm still young enough that I can I can make the transition and have um, a, a reasonably long career in aviation, and so I'm I'm doing everything I can to make that change now. So you mentioned something I want to go back on a little bit. You talked about sure. you, there's these points in your career where you thought about making the switch, but then you didn't. Mm-hmm. Were there any specific things that swayed you one way or the other, or what kind of process was that for you? So absolutely, and and for the longest time, I I. And it, I thought of, I did a lot of thinking because I, I set myself down. I was like, Brian, why did, I mean, I've, I've, I've been lecturing myself lately going, why didn't you do it? And I'm, I'm trying to go back. Early on, I always wanted to be a pilot. Uh, Jim, I, I, up until I got my pilot's license, I was scared to death. To, I loved airplanes and I loved flying. But when they would take off, I would indent the armrest. I was like white knuckling. the Like, I love flying, but I was, I just know that the more you fly, the more you're, you're going to chance, your chances are you're going to die in a plane crash. And so in my mind, I was like, well, if I met someone that was a pilot, I was like, okay, well, they're a pilot. Eventually they're going to die in a plane crash. This is my 22 year old self talking. Sure. Ignorant, ignorant, ignorant person. But I would go to the airport and park and eat my lunch and watch the planes take off and, and stuff. But I, it, it wasn't until about a year ago that I realized it was a fear of flying that kept me from doing it. And I, I pinpointed the moment. My wife got me a discovery flight years ago. And I remember she, she gave me a discovery flight. And I remember going to the airport and being absolutely terrified because what if I go take this t- discovery flight and I find out that it's, I'm scared to death. It's too bumpy. I, there's, I'm terrified. Then th- like, it's, it's like having a lottery ticket when they haven't drawn the numbers yet. That hope is so nice. Um, in, in my back pocket going, man, I, I would love to be a pilot. I think it'd be so cool. But if I did that discovery flight and I was scared that that lottery ticket, I just do it in the trash. That hope is gone. Oh, so sure, it's kind of yeah. like, 
kind of like finding out that, oh, well, that's really not an option anymore. So kind of just having the option was sort of nice. Um, but then I did, did my discovery flight and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is way more awesome. And, you know, yeah, I, you know, um, and at the time we didn't have any money. Uh, we were, I, I think we, well, it was probably about the time I had my first kid and, um, you know, so there was, there was, I went to a fly, I went to a flight school and they're like, oh, it's, you know, back, back then, I think they said it's like $10,000 or something. Now it's probably 20. And I go, well, I don't have $10,000. I can't be a pilot. Yeah. They never said like, you can pay it out or anything. And, um, so years and years and years went by. Um, and I said, man, I, th I think I want to go do another one of these discovery flights. And so I, I got on Craigslist and I found this, this guy who's like a fl cheap flight training. <laughs> that's what you want. <laughs> that, that's that's your first choice. Yeah, you know, I, I sorted by price and I picked the cheapest one, and I I, I lucked out. Um, I, I'd say that you probably did. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> if I'd gotten the next one, I wouldn't be here now. And so I I went up and took some flight. Or I called him and I said, look, I said I called a school and they said it's going to cost all this money. And he goes, yeah, that's about what it costs. And I said, look, can I do this? Can I just pay for one hour? And he goes, yeah, that's that's how this works. And I was like, okay, the school did not clarify that. They wanted all this money. Sure. And so I would just, just go out every once in a while and bring $150 with me and we go fly around in this 172. And, and I was like, okay, I, I you know did three or four flights. And then we're like, okay, he said, if, if you want to do this, you're going to have to start flying a little more frequently. And so I, I remember I was like, okay, I'm saving up like $700 and I'm going to go do like four flights in a week or whatever the number was. And so that kind of got me to progressing flying once every couple of weeks, one hour, you do the same thing over and over. But now I was like, okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm doing stall recovery and I'm doing these steep turns and I'm starting, I'm, I'm learning. Then training is pretty typical. Got my private pilot's license and, you know, many times in the last, I don't know, probably 10 years. Well, I'll say the, the, the first seven or eight years that I was a pilot, I had, you know, the thought of, I'd see people going to the airlines and I was making really good money and people going to the airlines were not making good money at all. And I was like, I, I simply can't afford, you know, what, what a, an American Eagle at the time was where a lot of people were going. And I was like, I, I, I can't live on that. You know, I do. I, I, I've got kids and a house and a mortgage and all, everything everybody's got. And so it was the fear early on which I, is why I didn't make the choice. And then it was financially um, the, the next next time I really seriously considered it. Well, now I'm not afraid. And now the rates are improving. And so I, uh, I you know, I've, I don't, I don't, I'm not hiding anything. My company that I'm in is, is having horrible financial difficulties and I don't know how long it'll be around. And so it's like, well, I don't want to be an IT guy anymore. Um, my skills have atrophied quite a bit. And so if I wanted to be an IT guy, I'd have to go start studying and learning all this stuff all over again. Sure. Or- I can start studying and learning aviation, which I, I'm, I'm to this day, I'm as passionate about as I was the first time I unwrapped a toy airplane, you know, under the Christmas tree as a kid. <laughs> Again, I mean, it's, it's still a haircut on the financial side, but it's not, it's not devastating. Like, and then after a couple of years, I'm back up to about, a, you know, where I'm comfortable. Um, so, you know, I've talked to my wife and we've said, okay, this is doable. And here's the weird thing. <laughs> If if you're a newish pilot and you're looking at me and you're like, oh, this guy's got 1,200 hours and he's got his commercial and his instrument and his multi, I keep telling people I'm at this point where I'm standing on the edge of the diving board looking at the pool and I can't figure out how to get in it. <laughs> <laughs> I am so close and yet the thing that's that's keeping me, uh, that the thing that's between me and being done is uh, uh, very, the, the multi training, you know, you, and I'm looking at ATP minimums and I'm like, okay, yeah, do I want to go take... Thirty thousand dollars out of savings to go pay for three hundred hours of of flying, which I need, and then you know five hundred hours a pop for multi training. So now I'm the guy going, you know, back to social media like 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 some younger people and going, hey, how are we how are we time building? Who's doing? You know, I've got a plane we can share. You know, how, sure. That, that, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out now how to get into the pool, and it, I can like I said, I'm staring right at it, um, and so I'm trying to figure out how to do it without, um without having to dip into my savings really is what it boils down to. And so um, I'm, I'm very impatient, which is part of it. Like, I feel like I'm going to get all this done this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not how it works, I right? <laughs> I know that's not how it works. And in my, in my mind, when I first got the, the commercial, I was like, okay, I'm like 350 hours away. I'm like, I'll give my, I don't know why I arbitrarily go, I'll give myself six months. I haven't flown 300 hours in two years. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to do it in six months. 
I, and part of it, I turn 47 tomorrow. And so it's like, I know, you know, at 65, maybe they'll make it 67, you know, there's going to be a cutoff. And so I'd, I'd like to get 15 years in. Yeah. And so realistically, if I, if I can get in, in the next two years, I'm fine. Um, but I do, I do now that I've decided this is what I want to do with my life. I no longer want to do what I'm currently doing with my life. And it, you can't just snap out of it. You gotta, you gotta figure out how to get out of it. And so that's kind of the, the transition, right? It's like, yeah. How do I do, how do I do this without saying I quit? We're going to be broke. You know, let's sell the house. I can't do that. So it's, it's, um, figuring out how to as pain-free as possible, get the hours that I need to get. Um, I went ahead and sent a couple of resumes to airlines just to see what they would say. And they, they came back with feedback saying, Hey, we're, you know, we're very interested, but you need to go solve these three problems. So, oh, okay. um, I was, someone said, go ahead and apply Like the worst they could do is say no. And they're not right. going to say no. They're going to say, come back later. You know, cause there's a, you know, this, this, this pilot shortage I keep hearing about seems to be real. Yeah. I think that's really interesting that you, you submit the applications and I'd imagine there's an era where they look at it and go, wow, you don't, you're not going to make the cut and that's the end of it. But the fact that they're giving you feedback, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. If, if you go to any, any place where you want to apply for a job, um, they all have ATP minimums listed. Everyone says, oh, you need 50 right. hours of multi. But if you talk to anybody who's a pilot, they'll say, just get 25. They're going to give you the other 25 as a part of your training. And I'm like, well, they don't say that anywhere. And I have a friend who just got a job, a conditional job offer. And I, I know two people who've gotten picked up by um, like cargo and different different types of things where on their website, they require ATP minimums, but these people aren't even close. And I'm like, okay, so maybe I, maybe, so I was like, I'm just going to throw some out there because yeah. maybe that's, that's their wish list, but maybe they'll take, you know, slightly lower minimums. So I am going to just kind of, every time I, cross some milestones, maybe send a couple more out and see, you know, but I, I don't, I don't think I'm hurting myself by doing that. Um, I wish there was something, you know, like when I, when I look at it jobs, there's always like, here's the requirements and then here's our preferences. Yeah. I wish they would do that and say, we require, we, you know, our preference is ATP minimums, but here's our real bare minimum. And, I, and maybe they can't, but I'd like to, I'd like to know where the real bar is. Yeah. Right. So when you mentioned a little bit about like the financial state of your company and maybe that pushing you in one direction, but was there like a turning point for you that you're like, all right, this is it. I, I have to do this. I was at my desk and then we, we had with three offices across the U S one in Nevada, one in Pennsylvania, one in Texas. And they said, uh, in April, we're closing down the Nevada office. I was like, Oh, that's not good. And, um, I started, you know, looking at the financials of the company because my team does all the analytics. And so I've access to, <laughs> I feel like I, I need to tell you, I'm allowed to look at the data. Jim. Um, <laughs> I looked at it and I'm like, this doesn't look good. I was like, I wonder if I need to start getting my ducks in a row. And I will tell you right now, I sat down at my desk and I said, okay, um, I've got to go learn this thing called JS query and I've got to learn Node, Java, whatever the things are. And I've got to learn Azure. And so I started going to UDME and downloading all these courses. They're like, they're cheap. They're like 19, 20 bucks and they've okay. got videos. And I started, started watching them and I was like, okay, because I, I looked out there, um, you know, no one's they, they, nobody wants a vb.net programmer sql server manager type it guy anymore they they want you if you're a director they want you to roll up your sleeves and get in the code and i'm like my skills are gone yeah um and so i said i gotta learn new skills and so i started re- watching these courses and i was like i hate this i hate the new tech i i find it to be incredibly inefficient i don't understand why programming has gone the way it's going like it, it takes me 20 steps to do something that I can do in one. And I know I'm the old man, get off my lawn, but I'm like, I, I don't want to do this. And I have a post-it note uh, in, my, in my desk right now that said, what do I, I, I wrote, Brian, what do you want to be doing in five years? And I wrote, I want to fly jet. I wrote that down in April on a post-it note. And I thought, okay. And I gave myself, I was like, you got to figure out how to fly jets in five years. Well, that was April. Uh, I flew my a citation for the first time last month. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't think it's going to take five years, but I, I did in that moment go, I can't stomach uh, uh, round two of an IT career, the the learning to get up to it, like it, like back then in college, it was fun and I liked the, I liked solving the problems. And, and now, the companies that own everything have made it so you don't get to solve the problems. You get to purchase their pre written libraries and leverage their sure uh, stuff to solve problems. Like you you basically are are a slave to a hundred different vendors that you pay you rent software from, you know, as a service to run your company like you're not building anything and it's like and even if you want to build it you've got to run it on a cloud like i i'm 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 against the current model of software development and i I don't i think it's it's a screw job to get us to continue to pay these companies a ton of money and they've taken the logic and problem solving out of the the hands of really bright people 
and I, I don't want any part of it. I don't care if it pays a million dollars a year. I don't want any part of it. I I, I think it's it's in my opinion, <laughs> it was it used to be better <laughs> back in my day. Back in my day, <laughs> yeah, back in my day. Um, and so I did. I was like, I was. I, I realized if I go down this path of trying to do this, I am going to be twice as miserable, twice as frustrated. I'm going to be doing something yeah. that I now hate, fundamentally disagree with uh, the paradigm. And so I was like, okay. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to fly. So okay, how do I how do I make that? How do I make that happen? And so that's that's where I'm at now is figuring out how to become a professional pilot. So when you started down this journey, you had your private pilot certificate, you're doing content creation, probably building some decent hours doing that. Where were you at within your certificates at that point? And how much, like, where did you need to go still? Uh, it's funny. So I, I'm accidentally where I'm at. So <laughs> I really, I am. I, I learned to fly because I wanted, I liked airplane. Um, and so I have my, my private and that was all I ever wanted. Like, I just wanted to be a private pilot. I just wanted to learn to fly. Well, um, you know, because I was doing content creation, I have uh, a really great sponsor called Gold Seal. I love Gold Seal. Um, and my relationship with them started because the owner and I are on a forum together and he said, hey, would you mind? He goes, I know you're a software guy. Would you mind testing our instrument software? And I said, yeah. I said, uh, I'll give it a shot and I'll test it to if I find any bugs. And so, you know, I went through the course and then I said, I said, I'm going to go ahead and go take the test. Like the software seems to work great, but let's, let's, let's find out. And so I went and I took, took my instrument uh, written. I, I think I got a really good, like an, an A on it. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. And then I never thought twice about it. I then was flying around and once, and I got stranded because of some weather. I landed at an airport that looked, it looked like a big airport from the sky. It was like, they got three runways and this is where I'll, I'll I'll get a hotel, and then I landed, and they're like, "We don't have Uber, we don't have Lyft. There's no hotels, there's no taxi." Like <laughs> they're like, "We're we're, we're shut. Like you're going to sleep in your plane tonight." And I was like, "Oh no!" And so I had a little bitty hole in the weather, and she goes, "There's an airport over here if you can get to." And this is a story. This is the story people tell when someone dies. I, I it's, it's it was a 13 minute flight, and I mean it was BFR, but it was it was closing in really fast, and it was it was raining hard everywhere except this little hole I was in and uh, she said uh, if you can get to this airport they've got hotel they've got everything and I said okay I looked at it and so smartest thing I did well I don't know what this, it, it was going to be socked in for about a week so if I was going to spend one night there I was going to spend five and I, I have a job so yeah I said what, here's what I'm going to do I said I'm going to get my plane I'm just going to get fly one lap around the pattern and I'm going to get up to pattern altitude and I'm going to turn extended traffic on in four flight and see if there's people flying around at that other airport uh, so I did, I got up to pattern altitude and I turned on extended and I saw three or four planes in different legs of the pattern at the, at that airport. And so I said, okay, it was clear between me and there. And, uh, so I said, I'm, I'm just going to go for it. And I was in the Cirrus. So I was in a you know, capable plane. Yeah. Um, and I, I got over there and there was a couple of planes coming in and a couple of planes in the pattern. It was VFR. I landed and probably within 15 minutes it was socked in. And I was like, you know, should I have, I don't know. Um, and, but then I got an Uber and I took a two hour Uber to Memphis and I got a commercial plane ticket and I flew American airlines to my house. <laughs> I mean, so quite a debacle, very expensive, yeah. time consuming. And it was like, it, it, it wasn't thunderstorms. It wasn't horrible, but it, it was not something that I, I was rated for. And so I was like, okay, I've done the instrument test. I've had a few lessons. I said, I'll go. And my, my test had expired. If you, if, if you ever take your instrument test, go get the rating. That test is the worst. Yeah. It's not fun. Oh, it's, it's so bad. I called Gold Seal uh, up and I said, hey, I said, I need to reactivate this. I think I'm really going to do it this time. And they said, great. So we went through the course again, um, took the test again, passed, got through about half my flight lessons and... COVID hit. Uh, no one's flying. No one can be in a plane with you, whatever the rules are. And yeah. You're trying or whatever. And so I'm just like, screw it. I'm done. I don't care. I don't know how long we called it. Like we, uh, we, it, it was right at the beginning where everything, we, we just didn't know. And so I, I don't even think I was flying solo that much. But once things loosens back up, I said, you know, I, I really think I want to get this rating because I don't want to be in that, that position again. So um, I got with Christy Wong and uh, she and I started doing instrument training together and somehow or another managed to get it knocked out. So this guy who was only going to be a VFR pilot now had an instrument rating. And I was like, okay, I like having a goal. 
I tossed around the idea of going commercial mainly because people had told me it was a gimme. And I was like, I'll take, I'll do anything if it's a gimme just to have more letters behind my name if I don't got to work for it. <laughs> and so I, I debated about it and I went, you know, back and forth for probably a year. And finally I said, you know what? I'm going to go, go ahead and go, go get the commercial. Like I, I thought maybe I'll be a CFI and have like a side hustle. Like I was like, I, I got, maybe I'll fly skydivers. Like, I don't know. Maybe, but maybe it'd just be one more thing where I could just make a little extra money on the side. Okay. Started doing the commercial and it's the most fun I've ever had in a plane. It's the most confidence building rating. I am a different pilot than I was six months ago. Um, my wife, she was, she was watching the video recently. And she's like, you are like owning it. She's like, I, I can tell like you're, you're, you're cautious or whatever, but she's like, I, I, I'm telling you that rating. If, if anyone has even a tiny bit of like being timid, I've power on stalled a plane prior to getting my commercial once on a check ride for my private and once on a BFR. Um, I, I, I do it all the time now. And it's like, I, I was terrified of it. So uh, I got that rating and then about the time I was having this epiphany that my, my company was having issues, I didn't want to be an IT guy. And I told someone, I said, I'm, I'm actually considering not doing IT anymore. I'm considering, you know, going professional. And he, he asked me, he goes, how many hours do you have? What ratings do you got? And I said, all, all this and that. And he goes, well, you're a hundred thousand dollars into being a commercial pilot. And he goes, but you spread it out over 10 years. He goes, there are people who want to go do that and they got to go get a hundred thousand dollars in debt. So you're so close. And I started thinking about that and I was like, well, yeah, I've, I haven't intended to do it. Um, but I've, I've spread the pain of getting to where I'm at, you know, un unintentionally over a large period of time. And so it was like, okay, well, what do I, what do I need if I want to go be a pilot? And some, you know, someone said, go get your multi. And I think I'm transparent about this. Dan Milliken and I did our accelerated tr training in exchange yep. for some, some marketing. We were given a, a discount that made that not a question in our minds, my mind anyway, because I, I think I've stated this before. My YouTube channel funds my flying. I, I, tr I try not to use my personal expenses for it. Okay. Um, and so, so I'm very, very, I'm a penny pincher when it comes to aviation because up until now it's been, I don't want to use my family's money for my hobby. And so now I'm going, okay, well, if, if it's not going to be a hobby, so I'm, I'm having internal discussions about that, but, um, so we got to multi. And so I never said, I'm going to go be a pilot. What are the steps? What's this? I mean, every rating I kind of hesitated and kind of sort of stumbled into and like even getting my multi with Dan, Dan's not going to go fly multi. He's like, I just want to get the rating. And I was like, okay, well, let's go get the rating. And, you know, just like I would say, let's go get a seaplane or a tailwheel. I'm not going to fly those planes, but it'd be cool to do. Yeah. And that's how I've approached a couple of these things. But in doing that, I've, I've positioned myself to where a flying career for an airline is not insane anymore. I'm at the edge of that cliff and I'm just trying to figure out how do I jump? I think that's a really interesting point that you brought up that like you spread out this huge amount of debt that some people take on like right at the outset over all these years. So, I mean, in some regards, it that might help better position you to keep moving forward as opposed to already having all this debt and now you still have to build hours. Sure. It is. I'll tell you, if my company wasn't having financial difficulties, I would take the money out of my bank account right now and go pay for all the hours I need. Yeah. But what I don't want to do is go take that out and then I don't have a job. And now it's like, oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing is I'm trying to balance these things out. And so you're going to see a lot more videos on my channel lately. I need some ad revenue. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you could just loop them in the background, man, it'd be great. Every penny matters. Every, <laughs> every play matters, I suppose. So what's the most exciting part of this journey that you've had so far? Taking off and landing airplanes. Don't you just get like <laughs> totally high? Like, isn't that the best thing in it, the world? It like, is. It really is. I'm going to use the lottery ticket example over and over. Maybe I rushed through life because of it. Just looking forward to getting to do this stuff. And, and now I'm I mean, I'm interviewing pilots who work for airlines and going, tell me what you love about your airline. Tell me what you hate about your airline. So I'm going, okay, you know, I, my, my end goal is that I, I would love to end up at this particular airline because they do more short hops and I like taking off and landing. I don't want to just sit on a plane for eight hours, you know, that kind of thing. So sure, playing playing the little, what am I going to do with my lottery winnings is is very fun planning for the future. The, the best part of the journey is just flying. We went to Gaston's, I say we, I went to Gaston's, Arkansas. Um, two weeks ago, I go there every year for a fly-in event, and I was like, I need some night hours. And I man, I love flying at night, but I hate flying at night. Um, you know, it's beautiful, it's smooth, it's quiet, it's cold, it's great. But then your plane starts making weird noises, and you're like, uh oh, right. <laughs> um, so I was like, well, I need some night hours, and so I took off the night before the full moon, which was great. And I was like, I'm just going to go kind of close to Arkansas. So I ended up in Branson, Missouri, at this hotel called the Old English Inn. It was a British themed hotel. And I, I mean, it was, it was the wild, like just random middle, I say middle of nowhere, it's Branson, but it's, it wasn't like, I, I was like, I'm going to go in the middle of the city. I, I picked a hotel sort of by price, picked the cheapest one. And it turned out to be this really cool thing. I'm telling my wife, like, this is a crazy hotel. And there's like a big group of like 30 people that brought a bunch of whiskey and were playing cards and being really loud. Like, I, like I'm like, this place is just like wild. And if there's a restaurant connected to it and it's, you just feel like I've not been to England, but it's clearly designed to make you feel like you're, you're there. 
uh, cool. just old co- cobblestone. So, so like just the fact that even though I'm I'm in a sense working towards a goal and a career and all this kind of stuff, the journey is sprinkled with little gems here and there. And, and it's like in aviation, you have this ability to to discover new things unintentionally. And one of my favorite ones, and this is a weird tangent, but um, you go to Oshkosh every year. Um, I don't know, a handful of years ago, eight years ago, um, we just stopped at an FBO for fuel. And there's this this lady named Ruth comes out. Oh, And yeah. she's like, oh. And then she's like, I want to take a picture of you and I'm going to put it in this book. And so my dad and I were together and we started flipping through this book. And I was like, oh, here's someone from Gainesville. It was a local guy. I know him. He's in the book. And I go, how long have you been doing this? And she said, 21 years. And she had every book back from, you know, whatever 21 years ago was. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I started telling everybody, like, you guys got to go see this. And so I go back the next year, we go look for our old pictures and our friends. And um, unfortunately, she passed away, um, I believe, just before Oshkosh this year. Okay. But just just stopping in a random FBO because the fuel price was right. And it was like, this is where, and even now, like, if I'm going to Oshkosh, I'm stopping there for fuel because that was such a cool thing. I wanted, and, and the guy who's running the FBO now is continuing what she was doing. Um, but you have this ability to, in your car, not so much. You don't just go to a gas station and be like, let me explore this town. But when you're in a right. plane, you get out and you're like, well, I've got to get in a car and go find food. And so you end up kind of creating adventures, just trying to get from A to B because you stop at, you know, A.1 and A.2 and A.3 to get there and on the way back. And that's one of my favorite things is going, okay, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to go to gas this tomorrow, but what's going to happen in between? And, and I, you know, what am I sure. going to experience? And it's that is just cool and then to go i'm doing this because i need night hours you know it's not college you know college it's like this sucks but i got to get the degree this is like hey i'm having a lot of fun you almost forget that i'm doing this because this is going to better you know be a better position in the future so that that whole part of it is is it's just kind of interesting to me to go i'm working towards a goal but it didn't work and uh, i'm discovering new things along the way and so i'm i'm really enjoying the adventure of it that is so cool so as you're in the middle of this journey right now what advice do you have for anyone else who's maybe on the cusp of going, I want to make this a career. There's nothing I can say that won't sound like a cliche. Life is short. Go, go, go get it. Like I'm, I'm for, re- and it's, it's just, I hate sounding like an old person, but I know why old people sound like old people, Jim. Time is limited, right? Yeah. It's a very limited quantity. And what do you want to do with it? And when you're young and stupid, it doesn't matter. You live life. I would say up until you're 40, like you're going to live forever. Cause like, even in my head, I still feel like a 15 year old kid. Um, but when I start going, okay, if I go to the airlines, I'm going to retire in 15 years and then, then I can go do, you know, other stuff if I want to keep flying in, in other other ways. But then, then it's like, well, there's there's that voice going, well, what, what if you get skin cancer? What if you get this? What you? It's like, you can what if yourself into staying in that cubicle. And it's like, what if it doesn't work out? I'll go back and be an IT. You know what? I've I've So if you're, if you're transitioning, you've got a parachute. You're already wearing it. Take the parachute off, pack it back up, go, go try to be a pilot. If it doesn't work out, you, I can go find another IT job. The safety net's in place. I don't like the safety net, but it exists. Yeah. I can go learn Python and become a, a Python programmer and get a job if I really, really have to. If you really want to do it, you're going to have to turn off the voice that's giving you reasons why you shouldn't. It was like Stephen Covey that said, people don't change until the pain of not changing exceeds the pain of changing. Well, it's, it's very easy to go, this is easy and I'm just going to keep doing it. When it's time to retire, what did, what did I retire from? Oh, 15 more years of sitting behind a screen. Okay. Can't wait to tell my grandkids those stories. You know, or yeah, I went out and I flew a jet or I tried. You know, yeah, and and when I, I you know I tried, or I, I made it, or I didn't make it. But let me tell you about this hotel in in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> let me tell you about this lady, lady Ruth, that does this great thing. Or let me tell you about all these great things that are that are story worthy because I I went for it. And so, just jump. So Brian, as you made your jump, did you have any experiences that could be used as like a cautionary tale for others? I'll, I'll give you a great example when I say it's easy to jump wrong. I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's an instructor and, and I was just talking about this ATP stuff. And I said, well, I'm, I'm flying to uh, Kansas tonight. And I said, I got a hotel room. I just need to get this long. It was for my commercial. I go, I need to get this long night cross country thing log, uh, knocked out. And so I booked a hotel room. I filled up the plane. I was ready to go. And he's like, well, what are you, which one are you talking about? And I was like, the long cross country, the night cross country. He goes, you know, that's dual, right? And I said, no. And I got my far aim out and I go, it doesn't say anything about dual. And he goes, yeah, the, the indenting in the far aim is really poor. That's actually under a heading of instruction on the previous page. And I was like, holy crap. I was about to waste $400 in fuel in a hotel because I was going to, I'm going to say I jump wrong. Like, yeah. So that, that when I say I don't know how to jump in the pool, I'm trying to not make mistakes that cost time and money. And so I'm trying to figure out the right way to, to do it. 
because I would have taken that flight and then I would have gone to my commercial check ride. And he would have been like, hey, sorry, we got to cancel. You haven't met this requirement. And I would have felt like an idiot. So thank God I talked to that instructor. So it's it's complicated and I'm trying to make sure I do it w as efficiently as possible. And so that's that's where I'm at right now is going, OK, I need 16 night hours. I can get those easily. I need about 300 hours total. That's easy. I need instrument simulated hours. I'll call Christian. We'll go do it. And then I need these yeah. multi hours. I need either 25 or 50. I don't I don't know. Um, on the on on the paper it says fifty, but everyone's telling me twenty five. So I think I'll do get the twenty five, and then send out some applications and see if everyone comes back and says no, you need twenty five more. Then I know okay, I got to do that. If you want to do it, the, the first thing is don't try to convince yourself you don't want to do it or you can't do it because it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to go shouldn't do it, can't do it, it's too hard. Um, and I'll tell you, Jim, I'm I'm applying at skydiving schools. I'm applying. There's a company that does these um, uh, sunset date night skyline tours um flights because i'm like well that way i can fly someone else's plane um yep. and it's not costing me money and it's you know they're night hours and so i'm like okay there there are ways to to start flying now where it's it's not it's not a money maker or anything like that but it's like 300 hours in my plane is somewhere between 20 and twenty five thousand dollars in fuel well i i need to spread that over some time um or if i can find if i can go fly skydivers and go out saturdays and sundays and you know fly someone else's 182 um, then i'm not paying that money so that's that's where i'm at now is going okay well i, w I need to get hours but i don't i don't want to jeopardize my financial situation by paying for them all at once myself yeah. so i'm i'm looking at can i tow banners can i fly pipeline can i do photo sh stuff like that so i'm i'm this week i've started just going okay where are the aviation jobs that aren't you know airline jobs that i can do you know, as a side hustle. And so that's, that's what I'm looking at now. I'm going, okay, well find, find an opportunity to, to cushion the blow or make it, make it easier. So that, that's, that's kind of my, where my head is at as we're speaking now. Okay. I suppose it is better to have a plan that you're flying that someone else is paying for the gas than you paying for the gas and you can build hours up that way. Yeah. Put hours on their engine and yep. you know, and if yep. you have a couple bucks, great. So I, I I love my Comanche, but I I should have either bought a twin Comanche or a one fifty. Either one of those would have been <laughs> <laughs> build hours for cheap or get that multi. You know. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. So as you continue down this journey, um, I'm hoping that you'll be willing to chat with us again as you progress and have maybe some more insight and thoughts about a professional flying gig. I think so too, because I can't wait. So one of one of the things I like. My wife says I'm a really good teacher. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm a really good explainer. I, I hate saying I'm really good at anything. It feels egotistical. Um, but I told you I'm a good communicator and I, I'm really good at yeah. tailoring stuff to my audiences. So I think I'm a good explainer. And so the stuff that I'm struggling with, my airspace video is a great video. If you yes, Google airspace, is. my video is going to come up. And that's that's something like, I don't get it. I don't understand airspace and nobody's explanation makes sense. And so I came up with a way that made sense to me. And I guess it resonated with other people because the video has done really well. And, and I, so many people have approached me about it and I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, I want to get past where I'm at now. So other people who are sitting here where I'm at going, okay, I don't, I don't, do I have to go to regional first? Why it was some of them want 2,500 hours of turbine and, and someone they, like, I, I don't know what I need to get. I don't, I want to be able to tell someone going, okay, I was as confused as hell. This is what I figured out. And I want, I, I can't wait to get on the other side. So, cause I, I know people are, especially people like me. Like I'm an older guy. I, I'm aware that I'm, I don't learn as well as I did when I was in my twenties. Yep. And so it's, it's, it's going to be hard. So anything I can do to make it easier, I'm going to do. And so if, if there are other people out there that are trying to maneuver these waters or they're thinking about it, I, I want to be able to go, Hey, I was there. I was there. And look, I talk to pilots all day that, that they give me answers that don't make sense. And I'm like, well, but that, you know, you lucked out or whatever. I want to be able to go, okay, here's here's A, B, and C. This gets you this. This gets you that. And and so I can't wait to be on the other side of it. One, because I want to be there. And two, this sucks. Like this, trying to figure out. <laughs> wow. I go, to, I, go to the, I go to the forums and it's like I ask questions and people are just arguing and giving you conflicting yeah. advice. And it's like, well, this isn't a, this isn't a good way. So I, like, I want to be able to go, I've done it. I got from A to B. And I did it with without incurring a bunch of loans. And I did it, you know, I, I have friends who made this transition late and they you know, we're able to live on a single income from their spouse type of situation. I, you know, I can't do that. Right. So I, I want to get through it and be able to go, you know, here's the tricks and here's, here's where you're wasting your time. Like so I asked someone, I said, should I go take the ATP, CTP, CPT course? And he goes, he goes, 
No, he goes, people online are going to tell you you need that. He goes, that is a waste of your time and your money. Do not do it. I was like, okay. I go, I, I was on the phone with them saying, I'm, I'm going to sign up for this course. And he's like, don't do it. He's like, you'll you'll get accepted at an airline and they'll pay for that for you. I was like, should I go get a type rating in a, a King Air? No, don't do that. Because there's people telling you, go do that. Go spend $8,000 on this type rating. And so I you know, talked to people going, you do not have to do that. And so someone, someone did say, go get the hours you know you need to get. You don't have enough multi. You don't have enough night. You don't have yeah. enough instrument. That's easy to get. Better. So- a few people have had the clarity to set me down and go, I understand why your brain's spiraling in nine directions. You got corporate pilots telling you one thing. You got, I don't know, drug runner pilots telling you another thing. Drug you know, runner every, pilots. Every, <laughs> I talk to every, hey, everybody's a friend. Uh, no, but you have, you have, the problem is you have 10, 10 different types of pilots telling you how they got where they are. Yeah. And it's like, you, you, you're going to end up spending money to go f- a direction that you're not wanting to go career-wise. Because I, I know what I want. I I want to fly professionally, but I, I need... I need retirement. I need medical care. I need those. So the airline career is better. I need stability. So as much as I would love to fly a citation and get one of those unicorn jobs where you're making a, a bunch of money every day, they, they, those things are rare and they're hard to come by and they fall apart. So like, I, I really need to be the guy who works for a very stable, large company uh, that's predictable. I, my best guess is I'll probably end up going the Christy Wong path. I'll probably end up doing the Envoy thing or some other regional sure. Um I think I think my dream is to end up at Southwest Airlines. I like the idea of a, a shorter flights, um, only one airframe. They fly the seven thirty seven. Yeah. You know, American. I don't know how many planes they got, but I don't want to learn a bunch of different planes. I right. just want to be really good at one. Yeah, you yeah, know? makes sense. So that's kind of my goal. Like, if if I could paint my own picture, I'd be like, what do I got to do to be a, a first officer of Southwest Airlines? Like, I, I think I would be very happy, even if even if I never became a captain. I think flying, and if I'm just the guy talking on the radio and doing the announcements and pulling the gear up and down, I'm okay. I'd You'd like be to be so great at those good. announcements. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see. That's what I've, my little post-it note says. But it says five years, and I think I can do it quicker. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome that you keep that post-it note, though, too. It's a little bit of a motivation, if you will. I will say that one of the things I'm actually most looking forward to for your career is uh, your first announcement that you make on guard as opposed to into the back of the <laughs> aircraft. Because <laughs> it's going to be all over YouTube, I'm sure of it. Oh, gosh. Well, Brian, I cannot thank you enough for coming on to my relaunch of Fly the Transition. I think that uh, your journey is just as important as those that have completed it as far as telling the story and kind of giving people a glimpse of what that process can look like. So I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. This is fun. So a huge thank you to Brian Turner for coming on the inaugural relaunch episode of Fly the Transition. As always, it's a huge treat when I get to sit down with Brian and talk about aviation with him. So I look forward to bringing him back on in the future, and we can hear some updates on what his journey is like as he transitions into his new career in aviation. So coming up on the next episode, I will be talking with David. He is in the UK. David was a tour manager for musical acts over there and worked his way to becoming a CFI. In addition to talking about his transitional journey in aviation, we will also talk about flying across the pond. So that'll do it for this episode of Fly the Transition. Thank you all once again for listening and for helping me celebrate the relaunch of the podcast. If you'd like to leave me some feedback or you're interested in being a guest on the podcast, you can contact me through any of my social medias or email at flythetransition at gmail.com. So until next time, wishing you all clear skies and smooth transitions. You've been listening to Fly the Transition. Life is too short for you not to do what you love. And our passion is to give you all the tools you need to make the transition from doing what you do to being in the aviation industry. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, you can reach out by email at flythetransition at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook at Fly the Transition. And the website for Flying Midwest Media is flyingmidwest.com. Keep soaring. See you next time on Fly the Transition.